Welcome back everybody. Today we are going to be studying about media literacy, multimedia communication, and social media communication. Let's dive right in. This is a excerpt from an article. It's by Never Seconds. With permission from teachers, the young girl that you see in the image, her name is Martha Payne, started taking photographs of school lunches at Lochfirhead Primary School. It's in Scotland. It's a two-hour drive, in fact, west from Glasgow. And she posted all of those photographs of her school lunches with ratings on how good or bad they were and reviewed the meals in simple terms. I would have preferred more than one croquette alongside her stark shots of measly portions of frequently fried and often processed-looking food. She ranked them on a number of different gradients. Some were so precise they were funny, such as pieces of hair and number of mouthfuls. Her blog could have been called Never Hair, since the food on her pristine style tray, prison style plate, was generally hair free. The response was astonishing. For a simple social media blog with images, within a week her site had drawn more than 100 thousand visitors as school kids from around the world began sending her photographs of their own institutional meals she posted them as well it became a kind of crowdsourced watchdog group to improve school nutrition standards she argued correctly that improved nutrition would sharpen minds and improve health and then this happened arthur payne put up this entry goodbye this morning in maths I got taken out of class by head teacher and taken to her office. I was told that I could not take any more photos of my school dinners because of a headline in a newspaper today. I only write my blog, not newspapers, and I am sad I am no longer allowed to take photos. I will miss sharing and rating my school dinners, and I'll miss seeing the dinners you send me to. I don't think I will be able to finish raising enough money for a kitchen for Mary's meals either. Goodbye. I'll bet you can guess what happened next. The outrage was so palpable and so voluminous that that day her school said, Oh, we would never censor a nine-year-old, except, you know, this morning. So that raises a question. What made them think they could get away with it? And the answer is every piece of history up until this point. Because due to online and digitally mediated communication, we have never been a more transparent and yet not transparent society in the same breath. So that means that institutional and authoritarian practices that used to work no longer work, and vice versa. So why is that? Well, one of the major topics that your chapter on media literacy and digitally mediated communication talks about is something called convergence. So what does that word convergence mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things, and whenever you hear the word convergence, you might think of a variety or an array of different ideas. So, for example, this is a great illustration of convergence. It's when you combine multiple tools into a single tool or instrument. This is sometimes called, for example, a Swiss Army knife or a multitask tool, whatever you want to call it. And uh, this, this is another form of convergence. This is when you take different kinds of food and then uh, you, you put all of those different kinds of foods together to create a new kind of food. Uh, we often will call it a sandwich. Another type of convergence, this is when two nerds, or well, people in general, get together and uh, they, they form either a legal or a matrilineal bond. Sometimes it's called marriage or a wedding. That's another kind of convergence. And then this. This thing that most of us probably have in our pockets right now is the ultimate illustration of convergence. Convergence is when you take a set of discrete instruments or tools and then you combine them together and you force multiply or exponentially increase not only the use but the value of those discrete tools. What do I mean by that? I mean, for example, up until now in communication history, the types of media that could reach out and could persuade or otherwise message a large number of individuals was very hard at interaction. In other words, 
that in the 20th century, satellite television could reach a lot of people, but those same people would have a very hard time interacting with the sources of those television programs. And typically, all of the media sources or outlets that were great at interaction, such as the telephone, were very bad at reaching lots of people. For example, in the 20th century, you could only have a phone conversation with one or maybe even a handful of people, depending upon the business line you were using. That's not true anymore because of digital media. Right now, you can leave posts and you can interact with virtually any media you come into contact with. So it's no accident that most of the media that we digest every day is designed and created by amateurs or novices. Whether you consider that media to be just the Instagram posts or text messages that you share, or whether you consider it to be the YouTube videos that you watch. So let's define and understand convergence a little bit better, because it's such a magnanimous idea in the history of human interaction. Now, this definition is somewhat fluid, because our understanding of convergence literally changes from year to year as more and more media becomes evolved or sophisticated in our culture and society. But if we had to define it, we would define it as the capacity to combine diverse media into a single instrument or, as Clay Shirky, the author of Here Comes Everybody, A History of the Internet, has said, it's as if when you bought a book you got the printing press for free, or it's as if when you bought a movie you got a studio to create your own uh, mediaized content. So, essentially, convergence is the amplification of media availability. So that reduces passivity and increases engagement. An excellent example of that is that a little over a decade ago, even in the infancy of the what we would call cellular or social media age, there was an earthquake in China. And, literally, the U.S. Geological Survey and major news outlets were learning that the earthquake had happened because of the fact that citizen journalists were posting images and sharing videos. So why is that important? Because the last time that China had had an earthquake of that magnitude, it took them months to admit that it had even happened. And they may have liked to have done that instead of admitting that an earthquake had occurred in the Sichuan province of China. But they didn't have that luxury. Why? Because they were operating under a 20th century model. They believed that most media came in from the outside, they believed that because it was so hard to generate, because it was generated by professionals, it came in very small drips and drabs. And they believed that because of that, they needed to point their quote-unquote great firewall of China outward instead of inward. And none of those things were true in this instance. It was created by amateurs, it was created in abundance, and it was created almost immediately. So that's created what we have now, which is a transmedia culture, a society where individuals are migrating between media to engage content on multiple platforms. For example, the last time you thought you may have felt an earthquake living in Oklahoma, did you go to the U.S. Geological Survey, or did you just text or go to Instagram or Facebook to see if anybody else in your vicinity had felt it as well? Chances are, if you're like most people in Western society, you chose social media over traditional media sources to get your answers. And this challenges our traditional perspective of what constitutes tangible communication. In other words, what is real human interaction in a world in which most of us do most of our communicating online instead of in the quote-unquote real world? In other words, what is the real world? As John Muscle said, if content is queen, king, then conversion is queen. So, let's talk about that a little bit more. Because we live in an increasingly mediatized society, this has placed a greater premium on people that communicate to develop what's called mass media literacy. In particular, it's created something called Media System Dependency Theory, or MSDT, as your textbook calls it. This is the degree of reliance on mass and social media to display cultural literacy that's required. In other words, if you live in a highly, highly mediatized society like we do, 
you might have to convey or display a certain level of competence when it comes to navigating multimedia and media literacy in order to just become an informed person. So what does that mean? In a society that's reliant upon media, mass media is uh, indispensable as an antecedent to social interaction. In other words, you need to have access to things like perhaps Facebook or YouTube or just even Google to do a simple Wikipedia search if you want to be a more or less sophisticated person in hypermediatized society. And that means that the idea of societies and audiences asserts that media has become the signature economic and political influence in society. In other words, if it doesn't exist on the internet, then it might not really exist. And this is something that we could compare in simple terms. I mean, if you eat a meal but you don't take a picture of it, did you really have that meal according to our social media ties society? But more importantly, notice how many political candidates have increasingly announced that they are running for elected office on social media rather than traditional media outlets. This leads to something called gratification theory. The premise behind this is that audiences tend to appraise media based on social and personal use. In other words, we're not appraising content on its accuracy anymore. We're appraising content on its accessibility. The easier something it is, is to get, the more likely it is it will be weighed with value. Stage one is that users tend to assess the labor and satisfaction radio of content. In other words, the easier something it is to get, the more likely it is that that content will be appraised with greater value. Think of it this way. We all know that, for example, fast food doesn't have a lot of nutritional value. And yet, people in Western society consume a lot of fast food because that food is fast. It's the same with social media because we have instantaneous and consistent access to information that's on the internet from others and from institutions, we tend to rate that information higher in value, not necessarily because of its veracity, but because of its accessibility. Stage two of the gratification theory states that audiences tend to favor certain medias based on personal and social motives. So think of it this way. When people took the newspaper, 30, 40, or even 50 years ago, chances are they were confronted by an array of different opinions and ideas, some of which they agreed with, others they did not, but they engaged with uh, the ideas that they agreed and disagreed with. But on the internet, especially if you carefully curate your social media accounts, whether that be Instagram, Facebook, or even your bookmarks on your Google Chrome or your Mozilla Firefox account, you can essentially turn information into a vending machine. You only select that information that ultimately supports your own confirmation or biases. And that means that in stage three, media provides high yields of satisfaction. And the media which does provide the highest yield of satisfaction will often subsume other forms of electronically mediated communication. So mass media then is frequently evaluated on its accessibility, how easy it is to get, its accelerated distribution, how easy it is to share, and its demographic appeal. In other words, does it reinforce or support my existing ideas? Edward R. Murrow, as in the Murrow Building, said the speed of communication is wondrous to behold, but it is also true that speed can multiply the distribution of information that we know to be untrue. A better way to say that is to quote this particular excerpt from the Ask a Question series. This is the editor of Discover Magazine, which said, In an internet-connected world, it is almost impossible to keep track of how systems actually function. Your telephone conversation may be delivered over analog lines one day and the internet the next. Your airplane route may be chosen by a computer or a human being, or most likely some combination of both, and don't bother asking, because any answer you get is likely to be wrong. And soon no human will know the answer. More and more decisions are made by the, and this is the important part, emergent interaction of multiple communication systems, and these component systems themselves are constantly adapting, changing the ways that they work. This is the real impact of the Internet. 
by allowing adaptive, complex systems to interoperate, the Internet has changed the way we make decisions, and more and more it's not individuals who decide, but an entangled, adaptive network of humans and machines. That last preposition, an entangled, adaptive network of humans and machines, is probably the operative to this particular excerpt. Because what the editor of Discover Magazine is essentially saying is that the decisions in developed nations or cultures are no longer made by people, per se. They are made by the interaction of people and machines. Let's put that in perspective. Imagine that you do a Google search for Hawaii, because since approximately 2010, Google now saves most of your searches or your search history. Then it algorithmically decides whether or not you are searching for one thing or another thing whenever you do more oblique or general searches in the future. So if you search for Hawaiian vacations or Hawaii one day, and then you begin to notice that there are more and more ads that show up for Priceline and other uh, Travelocity di uh, type websites. The next time that you search for volcanoes, Google probably doesn't think that you're looking for a science experiment for your nine-year-old. It probably believes that you are looking for volcanoes in Hawaii because of the entangled adaptive network of humans and machines. Or the last time that you used GPS on a long journey and were diverted because of real-time changes in the traffic network, you were essentially making decisions that then informed a GPS satellite network that would then inform other drivers. Now, this is these are both fairly benign examples, but I think you could probably see how these can be used for pernicious or particularly ethically inviolate extremes. Now let's talk about then social media influence. How can this interactive adaptive network influence us? Well, first of all, let's define it as the conglomeration of electronically mediated convergent content producing networks. That's a really, really, really dense definition. So let's just take a, a few seconds to unpack it. Conglomeration of electronically mediated convergent content producing networks. A content producing network is any social media enterprise such as Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest, etc. And when we combine those into a conglomeration, all of those tend to have an immediate influence on us. So what are the distinctions then between other mass media contents and social media? One is an idea called virality or going viral. That's the alacrity or speed which content receives comprehensive distribution. The other is mobility. In other words, one of the reasons why we use applications like Instagram or Facebook or Twitter is primarily because we can operate those communication channels from multiple physical locations. Think about just how difficult it is to access some uh, electronically mediated communication systems. Or think about using a landline. Every time you wanted to make calls, you'd have to be stuck in a particular place, sometimes at a particular time. So mobility refers to the fact that social media has accessibility precisely because we can take it with us. And this creates an intangible commodity in capital, the phenomenon of emergent artificial economies. In other words, this is value that only exists on the internet. And I'm not just talking about things such as Bitcoin. I'm talking about, for example, the number of likes that you have on particular Instagram posts or YouTube videos or how many friends you have on Facebook. All of those things only exist in a digital sphere. In other words, those friends aren't tangible. They are an intangible approximation of your genuine friends. So this changes our roles in the communication process, especially our conventional roles, because now instead of just being a sender and receiver, as is discussed in Chapter 1 of your course textbook, whenever you engage with social media, you immediately and instantaneously become a sender, receiver, and a gatekeeper. You operate on what we've called earlier in other lectures and discussions a polyvalent spectrum. And that means that all of that content that we access, that digital archive, has amplified our social identity and corrodes discrete communication settings. 
A final observation that social media communication heightens the gratification or our need for immediacy, permanence, and the reach of electronically mediated communication itself. Let's demonstrate an illustration of that. The world's biggest bank has no actual cash. The world's largest taxi company owns no vehicles. The world's most popular media owner can creates no content. And Alibaba, which is the uh, Easter equivalent of Amazon, is the most valuable retailer. It has no inventory. And the world's largest accommodation provider owns no real estate. So more and more, digital media, social media, is changing the actual economic landscape of our society and culture. And as you might expect, this can have some ethically interesting ramifications. We're going to watch a brief video uh, presentation by John Ronson. He is the author of the book The, the Men Who Stare at Goats, if you've ever seen that film. But he also works with social media quite a bit. Twitter is one of his particular passion projects, which gives a voice to the voiceless, according to Ronson. However, as you carefully watch the following presentation, I'd like you to identify one or more ethical considerations regarding electronically mediated communication that Ronson shares. Here we go. In the early days of Twitter, it was like a place of radical de-shaming. People would admit shameful secrets about themselves, and other people would say, oh my God, I'm exactly the same. Voiceless people realised that they had a voice, and it was powerful and eloquent. If a newspaper ran some racist or homophobic column, we realised we could do something about it. We could get them. We could hit them with a weapon that we understood, but they didn't. The social media shaming. Advertisers would withdraw their advertising. When powerful people misused their privilege, we were going to get them. This is like the democratisation of justice. Hierarchies were being levelled out. We were going to do things better. Soon after that, a disgraced pop science writer called Jonah Lehrer He'd been caught plagiarising and faking quotes, and he was drenched in shame and regret, he told me. And he had the opportunity to publicly apologise at a foundation lunch. This is going to be the most important speech of his life. Maybe it would win him some salvation. He knew before he arrived that the foundation was going to be live streaming his event. But what he didn't know until he turned up was that they'd erected a giant screen Twitter feed right next to his head. Another one in a monitor screen in his eye line. You know, I don't think the Foundation did this because they were monstrous. I think they were clueless. I think this was a unique moment when the beautiful naivety of Twitter was hitting the increasingly horrific reality. And here were some of the tweets that were cascading into his eye line as he was trying to apologise. Joan Alera boring us into forgiving him. And Joan Alera has not proven that he is capable of feeling shame. That one must have been written by the best psychiatrist ever to know that about such a tiny figure behind a lectern. And Joan Alera is just a frigging sociopath. That last word is a very human thing to do, to dehumanise the people we hurt. It's because we want to destroy people, but not feel bad about it. Imagine if this was an actual court, and the accused was in the dock, begging for another chance, and the jury was yelling out, Bored! Sociopath. You know, when we watch courtroom dramas, we tend to identify with the kind-hearted defence attorney that give us the power, and we become like hanging judges. Power shifts fast. We were getting Jonah because he was perceived to have misused his privilege. But Jonah was on the floor then, and we were still kicking and congratulating ourselves for punching up. And it began to feel weird and empty when there wasn't a powerful person who had misused their privilege that we could get. 
The day without a shaming began to feel like a day picking fingernails and treading water. Let me tell you a story. It's about a woman called Justine Sacco. She was a PR woman from New York with 170 Twitter followers and she'd tweet little acerbic jokes to them like this one on a plane from New York to London. So Justine chuckled to herself and press send and got no replies and felt that sad feeling that we all feel when the internet doesn't congratulate us for being funny. <laughs> Black silence when the internet doesn't talk back. And then she got to Heathrow and she had a little time to spare before her final leg. So she thought of another funny little acerbic joke. And she chuckled to herself, press send, got on the plane, got no replies, turned off her phone, fell asleep, woke up 11 hours later, turned on her phone while the plane was taxiing on the runway, and straight away there was a message from somebody that she hadn't spoken to since high school that said, I am so sorry to see what's happening to you. And then another message from her best friend, you need to call me right now. You are the worldwide number one trending topic on Twitter. What had happened was that one of her 170 followers had sent the tweet to a Gorka journalist and he retweeted it to his 15,000 followers. And then it was like a bolt of lightning. A few weeks later, I, I talked to the Gorka journalist. I emailed him and asked him how it felt and he said it felt delicious. And then he said, but I'm sure she's fine. But she wasn't fine, because while she slept, Twitter took control of her life and dismantled it piece by piece. First, there were the philanthropists. Then came the beyond horrified. Was anybody on Twitter that night? A few of you. Did Justine's joke overwhelm your Twitter feed the way it did mine. It did mine, and I thought what, what everybody thought that night, which was, uh, wow, somebody's screwed. Somebody's life is about to get terrible. And I sat up in my bed, and I put the pillow behind the head, and, and I thought, I'm not entirely sure that joke was intended to be racist. Maybe instead of gleefully flaunting her privilege, she was mocking the gleeful flaunting of privilege. There's a comedy tradition of this, like, South Park or Colbert or Randy Newman. Maybe Justine Sacco's crime was not being as good at it as Randy Newman. In fact, when I met Justine a couple of weeks later in a bar, she was just crushed. And I asked her to explain the joke. And she said, living in America puts us in a bit of a bubble when it comes to what is going on in the third world. I was making fun. In fact, Justine Sacco continued, I cried out my body weight in the first 24 hours. It was incredibly chromatic. You don't sleep. You wake up in the middle of the night forgetting where you are. She released an apology statement and cut short her vacation. Workers were threatening to strike at the hotel she had booked. If she showed up. And then she was told no one could guarantee her safety. So yes, the internet. Twitter, Facebook, and other social media platforms give us an enormous voice. A voice that has virality, demography, all of these things, but because of that, there are some ethical considerations that surround it as well. Here are just a few. One is identity contradiction. Social media presents an unprecedented fluidity and durability of our electronically mediated presence. So, in effect, we can be anyone that we want to be. And that means that, for example, we've had an increase in child predator incidents because of social media. Trustworthiness. A premium placed on viral content that diminishes our perspective and reliability. Because we tend to trust those websites that are the most accessible to us, that means that most, our most accessible websites can become platforms that can be exploited for political or other reasons. Passive participation, which is our capacity for an expression of disproportional impact. And finally, the knowledge gap disparity, the reliance on social media 
increases socioeconomic inequality. I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the state of Oklahoma, in order to be eligible for what's called income insurance or employment insurance, what would be traditionally called unemployment, you have to register online. Well, imagine if you don't have access to either Wi-Fi or a computer in your home or some sort of cellular device that can do those things with a 4G network. Now you have to go to a public place, such as a library. But in order to use a computer at a library, you have to get a library card. In order to have a library card, you need a permanent address and to have lived in that address for at least long enough to receive a utility bill or something to that effect. So, in a sense, some individuals that need unemployment insurance the most probably don't have access to it because of the fact that it has to be registered through social media means. Or, think about the different ways that we use Google Engine searches and the algorithms that are involved. If, for example, you type in the wrong words or the wrong grammar and syntax in a search, chances are you'll get a radically different suggestion from Google than if you use appropriate grammar. And again, that means that there is an interactive adaptive network that's making decisions about your aspirations and your intellect based upon your socioeconomic status. What it's like to live without broadband internet according to Cully Rogers. Wilfong is one of the more than 24 million Americans, or about 8% of the country, who don't have access to high-speed internet, according to the FCC. And that's a conservative estimate. They continue, this gap between the internet haves and have-nots is known as the digital divide. The problem isn't that these folks are missing out on spending an entire weekend binge-watching the latest season of Stranger Things. The problem is that increasingly the tools we use in our daily lives are moving online, sometimes exclusively. Students are assigned internet-based homework. Tax filings and applications for government programs are more commonly done online and are processed more quickly than snail mail. It affects so much of the economy in this country, and we're losing so much, Wilfong said. I want my kids to stay here. At the same point, there's not much for me to offer them. So, folks, all of these things are the ethical considerations surrounding social media. With that in mind, don't forget that you need to finish your quiz and discussion journal associated with Chapter 2 of your course readings. In the meantime, if you have any questions, just reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer them. Take care, and I'll see you soon.